Living with chronic anxiety can feel a bit like having one of those ambiguous doom nightmares where you know something is chasing you, but you can never see it, can never touch it, can never really sense or articulate exactly what it is. You just know it's there, you know it's after you, and you know you have to get away from it. Now take that feeling and put it into the real life and make it never stop. That's chronic anxiety. Anxiety can also cause a lot of symptoms that can mimic other conditions such as ADHD, insomnia, depression, or even irritable bowel syndrome. My name is Dr. Scott, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, and today we're gonna to review the seven official DSM-5 symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. These are not some uh, clickbait influencer secret signs of anxiety, these are the real actual symptoms as defined by the American Psychological Association broken down into some information that I think you'll find very easy to understand and very useful. So the core symptom of generalized anxiety disorder is frequent and persistent worry thoughts that are difficult or impossible to control and are somewhat out of proportion to actual events in the person's life. I know that that last part might sound a little judgy because who's to say how much anxiety someone should experience, right? But what we're trying to capture with that part of the diagnostic criteria is that this is different from somebody who just has a really stressful life. Now, of course, you can have a very stressful life and still also have anxiety, but many people who live with chronic anxiety feel like someone who has an incredibly busy, high-stress life would even during periods of downtime, even during times when there's nothing wrong or no clearly identified threat. It is a chronic constant feeling that is not completely connected with reality. And because it's not completely connected with reality, you also cannot simply or easily just dismiss these feelings or these concerns. They tend to persist even in the face of problem solving or coping mechanisms or other therapy tools to some degree. So a person who lives with chronic anxiety probably never really feels relaxed. It's all relative. It's all just degrees of anxiety. It's not am I anxious, it's how anxious am I? And to be sure, there are ups and downs, there are highs and lows, but there are very rarely, if ever, periods of time where anxiety is truly absent from a person's life when they have anxiety disorder. Interestingly enough, the one exception to that that you might notice is that the periods when you feel most calm if you are living with anxiety are the periods of time right after something really stressful has actually happened. You might notice that those are the only times that the anxiety really completely leaves your system for a period of time. The reason for that is when you are constantly living on this edge, when you're constantly on pins and needles, constantly waiting for something terrible to happen, until something actually happens, your anxiety never gets to release. It just stays bottled up and stays trapped inside of you. Those moments in life where something really big or really bad actually does happen trigger the release of all this physical and emotional tension you've kept inside of you. And so those are often the few moments, the few little corners of your life, so to speak, where that anxiety actually really noticeably decreases. Otherwise, the rest of the time, chronic anxiety tends to feel a little bit like playing one of those whack-a-mole games at the carnival where you knock something down so you're stressed about one thing, right? And either you get through it or you manage to convince yourself that it's gonna be fine, whatever. You solve this particular problem and then something else just pops up. Now I'm anxious about this instead. And it never really feels like a battle that you can truly win. Almost everything you experience in life when you're dealing with chronic anxiety feels like a potential threat. Every time you leave the house, every interaction, every responsibility, every obligation, every action, your brain will constantly identify a bullet point list, all the ways that might go bad, go wrong, hurt you, make you look like a fool, whatever it may be. And so everything in life, or almost everything, maybe other than a few select safe people or activities or environments, Everything feels aversive to some degree. Everything feels scary and probably unpleasant and maybe not worth doing. And that's why we tend to avoid a lot of things when we're anxious. I like to explain anxiety to people as it's a little bit like if your emotions had allergies. And I'm also somebody who lives with physical allergies to like almost everything. 
And basically, my body thinks the world is constantly trying to kill me. My body thinks that pet dander and pollen and dust are actually deadly neurotoxins. And when they enter my body, I have to leak various fluids out of my face in order to expel all this stuff from my body because something in me thinks that's deadly and it might kill me. Anxiety is basically just the emotional version of chronic allergies. The second symptom of chronic anxiety is restlessness. Now this can be a physical restlessness, a mental restlessness, or probably in most cases, both. The physical restlessness associated with anxiety can actually look a lot like someone who has the hyperactive symptoms of ADHD, where there's a lot of like repetitive motor movements, a lot of bouncing of the leg or fidgeting with your hands, like constantly messing with a pen or your own skin or your own body or tags on your clothes. And it's very difficult for a person with anxiety to really just be still because they never actually feel still on the inside. And so what we can see, what you can see in, in somebody's body who is anxious reflects their internal state. There's this constant rush or movement of energy, but it's not really able to be directed anywhere most of the time. Because most of the things we get anxious about don't actually happen, let's be honest. Most of them don't. And so all this energy just cycles through our bodies over and over and over again without an outlet. So it shows up in these very like purposeless, repetitive motor movements. We also tend to experience psychological restlessness, which usually feels like racing thoughts. It's kind of like, imagine if somebody like drank three Red Bulls and tried to give a speech to you, and it's like they're saying a lot of things, but they're maybe not even finishing their sentences, or they're asking a lot of questions, but these questions kind of have cliffhangers and never get answered, and it's just like this constant barrage of information, but the information isn't necessarily practical or well-organized, and it just never stops coming, and you never, you always feel like you're trying to catch up with the information, and you never can get caught up. Then you get stuck in these feedback loops where because you have all this physical and mental restlessness, your brain interprets all this energy being built up inside as we are still in danger. Because when you experience a fight or flight response, when something triggers your danger sense, you prepare for action. And that's why all this energy builds up in our body when we're anxious, because our brains on a subconscious level have interpreted something that's happening in our lives, or something that might happen in our lives, as being a potential mortal threat to our existence. So they build up this reaction so we can prepare to fend off the threat or to escape the threat. The problem is the threat usually either doesn't materialize at all or it's not something that creates instant mortal danger. Like if I have anxiety before giving a public speech, there's no opponent to, to fight or defeat. Um, I could run away from it, but that's probably not gonna be real helpful. So there's no action that I can take to use all this energy that's built up in my body and then trigger my brain to say, oh, he used all his energy, he must be safe now because he escaped or defended himself from that threat. So when this anxiety, when this energy stays trapped inside of us for days or weeks or months, our brain interprets that as we are still in danger. The big scary thing hasn't happened yet because we haven't actually had the fight or flight response. And that's again why sometimes that anxiety finally calms down after a big stressor actually happens. The third symptom of generalized anxiety disorder is intense difficulties with focus, concentration, or memory. And this set of symptoms can look a lot like someone with inattentive type ADHD or what's called ADD by most people. In fact, this is the most common differential diagnosis question that I get as a psychologist is, does this person have anxiety, ADD, or both? Because they look shockingly similar. But the con but, but the internal processes causing those symptoms are very different in someone with anxiety versus someone with ADHD, and they need to be treated differently if you wanna treat them effectively. The reason that people with anxiety often have difficulty with focus, concentration, and memory is because anxiety is a very psychologically taxing state to be in. So if you think of, if, if you were to think of your brain activity as being represented by pie chart, right? And there's maybe two, three, four different slices of this pie representing what is your mind focused on at any given time. Having chronic anxiety is like having one piece of that pie and the size of that piece will depend on the severity of your anxiety. 
but let's say it's maybe 20%, maybe 30%, maybe even 40 or 50%, maybe more for some people. A big piece of this pie is reserved for worrying. And that piece is always present. There's always some level of stress or worry or concern happening inside for you. And so it gives you fewer mental resources remaining to actually go out and live your life with. So the leftover chunk is what you're using to do school or go to work or take care of your home or interact with other people. And because you don't have as much of your pie chart left over as other people, your cognitive performance is gonna to tend to be lower than theirs might be. And that's what creates these kind of ADD-like symptoms. Another way to think of it is it's sort of like when you have a really resource intensive process running in the background on one of your devices, like your phone or your tablet or your laptop. If any of you have ever uploaded like a YouTube video or an Instagram video, you know that that takes a lot of device resources. And until that process completes, your device runs a lot slower and things might not quite work right or might not finish or might not load all the way. And it's because so much of your phone's resources are going to this upload. Anxiety is a little bit like having that background process running, only the upload never finishes. It's just this constant background process that takes resources away from everything else that you're trying to do. The fourth symptom of anxiety is what we call somatic symptoms. Somatic basically just means physical symptoms caused by something mental or psychological. A lot of people don't realize just how physical your anxiety can be. In fact, for some people, they experience the majority of their anxiety as physical sensations rather than worry thoughts or feelings of dread or panic. Some people actually feel it primarily in their bodies. In fact, I am one of those people. When I get anxious, I don't necessarily get a bunch of worst case scenario worry thoughts or a hugely overwhelming emotion of like fear or dread. My body just starts to freak out and it feels like something is medically wrong with me. But thankfully, I have been in this game long enough to know it is just my anxiety. So some of the most common somatic symptoms of some of the most common somatic symptoms of anxiety. What anxiety does is it triggers the activation of your sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight or flight system. And your nervous system regulates a lot of unconscious physical processes, things like heart rate, breathing, digestion, muscle tension, sensory input, skin response, all these things that you don't think about and don't consciously control. Your body automates these things and fluctuates them depending on what's going on in your life. When you experience heightened anxiety, it moves that autonomic nervous system into a more sympathetic driven state of functioning. And what that means is your heart rate is typically going to increase. You may even notice it. You might become aware of your heart beating where you often don't even notice that sensation. Your breath is gonna become shallow and rapid. So you're gonna notice that you are having more breaths per minute and that your, your air is not kind of reaching the bottom of your lungs like it might typically. It's this very kind of high level breathing. Your digestion when you're in a somatic nervous system response, or I'm sorry, a sympathetic nervous system response, your digestion actually slows down. And this can manifest as a lot of GI or stomach type, and this can manifest as a lot of GI symptoms, stomach aches, nausea, indigestion. It's really similar to what somebody who has like IBS, irritable bowel syndrome might experience. And that's another common differential. I don't do those differentials since I'm not a medical doctor, but anxiety can actually be very difficult for some people to tell apart from medical conditions that might create some of these same physiological changes. There tends to be a strong increase in muscle tension, particularly in often the jaw or face, neck and shoulders, or sometimes hands and legs or arms and feet. It depends a little bit on where a person carries their tension. It can vary from one person to the next, but your muscles tense up when you're more anxious because yet again, this is your body preparing for some kind of mortal danger or some kind of physical action that it thinks you're going to have to take. The fifth symptom of a chronic anxiety disorder is difficulty with sleep. There's a couple different ways that this can look. Some people experience 
insomnia, where it regularly takes them an hour or more to fall asleep, even when they're actively trying to fall asleep. Other people experience interrupted sleep, where they're waking up two, three, four, five, six, seven times during the night, and having a lot of difficulty going back to sleep. Each of these awakenings might take 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours. So one way or another, anxiety tends to be really disruptive towards our ability to get restful sleep. The reason this happens is that anxiety disrupts our ability to go from what's called beta wave production in our brains, which is when we're awake and alert and processing and busy, to alpha wave production, which is a brainwave stage where we are still awake, but we're calm, relaxed, peaceful, at ease. So it's the feeling you get ideally, you know, shortly before you go to bed, shortly after you wake up, or after doing something really calming or relaxing like yoga or meditation or getting a massage. Those are all activities that typically produce alpha waves in the brain. Anxiety kind of inhibits or disrupts your brain's ability to go into that alpha wave state. Because when you feel like something bad might happen to you at any time, there's a part of your brain that does not want to relax, that does not want to rest, that does not want to let go of this on edge feeling. Because it can feel like as soon as I let go of this tension, as soon as I allow myself to relax, that's when the thing is gonna happen. And I have to be prepared for that thing to happen. I have to be on guard. I have to be ready for this unknown, invisible assault that could come at any time. So resting or relaxing when you have anxiety can actually feel dangerous. It can actually increase your anxiety somewhat paradoxically. So when you lay down and try to go to bed and you try to put yourself in that restful, calm, alpha wave producing brain state, your anxiety says, that's a terrible idea. That's the last thing on earth we should be doing right now. You are about to go to sleep. It is dark, you are vulnerable. You need to be on edge because danger could strike at any time. And you end up in this almost like a battle with yourself where you know you need sleep and you're trying to go to sleep and you desperately want to sleep and your brain just won't let you. And it is so frustrating. And that is part of why people with anxiety are often tired constantly, which is the sixth symptom of anxiety chronic fatigue. Now the fatigue that comes with anxiety isn't only because of the sleep problems. It can certainly be worsened by that, but that's not the only reason. And some people with anxiety experience chronic fatigue even if they don't necessarily have horrendous insomnia. Anxiety is a very taxing state to be in. It's not really a state of physical or mental functioning that we are built or meant to just stay in indefinitely. It is supposed to be an acute or short-term state that we experience when we're in danger or when we're in distress to help us get through that distress. The problem is because that danger doesn't come very often, we stay in this state for much longer than we're really designed to be in it. And it's extremely taxing on our systems and it is exhausting to be in this constant hypervigilant scanning for danger. The floor could drop out from under me at any time place. It's a little bit like, I don't know how many of you this reference will land for, but it's a little bit like overclocking a PC. So your PC uh, runs on this computer chip, right? and it comes with kind of a limiter on how fast it can run, you can do something called overclocking it, which unleashes its ability to go at full speed all the time. But it's not really meant to go at full speed all the time, and you have to have a really upgraded cooling system to prevent it from overheating if you do this, because it's very taxing on the hardware to be at this like hyper-functional state constantly. So anxiety is very similar to that. It's this sort of overclocked, overperforming, overheating state that is incredibly draining, incredibly taxing to be in chronically. So many people with anxiety get this really intense lull in their energy level or, for, or, or uh, general functioning. So many people with anxiety hit these lulls in their days where their energy just drops and their functioning drops right along with it. Many people often end up taking naps during the day because of their anxiety, which then also worsens their insomnia and creates yet another vicious cycle. That might be a theme you're noticing with some of these symptoms is many of these symptoms exacerbate the other symptoms and it kind of feels like this endless spiral that's really, really hard to get out of. So yes, 
anxiety is exhausting. The seventh official symptom the seventh official symptom of anxiety is irritability or short-temperedness. If you've listened this long, you probably don't have a difficult time understanding why somebody with anxiety might deal with irritability or short-temperedness because everything I've just said so far probably sounds absolutely horrendous to deal with, and that is because it is. With anxiety, we have devoted so many of our mental resources every day to fighting invisible battles that nobody else can see and that nobody else is even aware of. And by the end of the day or midday, or sometimes by like 10 a.m., we just don't have a lot left because we've used all these resources in here. We maybe haven't even done that much in our day yet, but we are exhausted. And because we are exhausted, we don't have a lot of patience left for dealing with annoying things or other people's problems or things that aren't working right. And so we often have very easily, so we're often very easily frustrated when things don't work out the first time or things don't play out the way they were supposed to or the way we expected because we are sick of surprises. We are sick of being caught off guard by events or feelings or thoughts and we just want a few things in our day to go smoothly. When they don't, we sometimes react in a way that might seem stronger than what the actual events of that situation would warrant. That constant fight or flight state puts us on edge and makes us more reactive. And frankly, we just want a period of our day when we can feel normal and not have to think about everything. That's really what we want. And when you're living with anxiety, those moments are incredibly hard to come by. They are precious, they're rare, they're the diamonds of your day. You're not gonna have them very often. And when you think you're gonna have one, when you feel like there's this moment coming up, seven, eight hours from now, it might be a nice period of my day. And as long as I can make it to that, and as long as that is what I think it's gonna be, I'll be kind of okay. Get to that moment, maybe it's, maybe it's a show. Let's say it's a show you were looking forward to watching. You get home, something's wrong with your TV. You can't watch the show. That's the only thing that you needed. It's the only thing you were looking forward to. It's the thing that was gonna make everything at least kind of okay today. Now it doesn't work. To an outsider, it might be like, you're having trouble with your TV. You know, this happens. TVs don't work sometimes. Electronics are faulty, whatever, it happens. You'll, you'll be okay. But if that's the one thing, if the anticipation of that one moment that has now been taken from you is the thing that got you through the day, you're probably gonna have a pretty strong reaction to that. Other people may not always understand it, but it is a part of anxiety. Basically, at the end of the day, the world itself feels aversive and threatening and overwhelming. And so we really just want these little pockets of time where we don't have to deal. And when those are taken from us or don't occur as planned, we're going to have strong emotional reactions to that. So those are the seven symptoms of generalized anxiety disorder. If a lot of what I just described sounds like you, I would strongly recommend that you talk to somebody about it. You can start even with your primary care doctor. These things are very treatable though. They can be treated through therapy, they can be treated through medication, they can be treated through lifestyle change even sometimes. You don't have to live with this forever, at least not at the intensity that I've described in this video. So if this sounds like you, I truly hope that you will go out and seek treatment because it can get better. I also hope that you might consider sticking around here because I've made a lot of these videos and I plan to make a lot more. I'm trying to bring awareness to what living with mental illness actually feels like because even with very common conditions like depression and anxiety, there is still a tremendous amount of misinformation and misunderstanding and stigma out there and I am aiming to correct those things. So I hope this is not the last time I see you. It's certainly not the last piece of content that I'm gonna create. Take care.